from the land of sky blue waters welcome to the soda pod you should join me here alongside seth topol and i thank you all for joining wherever and whenever you are listening the nhl playoffs are in full swing ladies and gentlemen and seth will be on shortly to talk about not only the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs, but a little bit of Minnesota Wild Talk, as well as some other pieces of global hockey news, ladies and gentlemen. Next week, by the way, we will start talking more and more about the junior hockey playoff finals and the respected junior A and major junior teams, as well as the RBC Cup and the Memorial Cup soon in Canada. But today, the focus is craft beer, NHL playoffs and your Minnesota Wild. So like I said, before we bring Seth on here, we will jump into the hoppy hour. Now, just want to say my apologies that a small chunk of the audio in the hoppy hour is a little bit compromised. Literally, my roommates had some laundry going and I'm pretty sure the washing machine is kaput. I'm pretty sure it exploded mid recording but we're all good now we're all good now and the beer really delivered a very big change of pace from what we had last week before we get into the beer review before we get into the hockey talk i just want to give a big shout out to our friends at northland vodka that is right northland vodka is a proud partner of the soda pod best damn vodka on the planet ladies and gentlemen mark parish and the team there are amazing an awesome product even better people and a small percentage of every sale goes back into the community goes back into local hockey here in minnesota so go get you some northland today a proud partner of the soda pod hoppy hour next on the other side here on the soda pod First, I'd like to propose a toast to UMD goaltender Alex Stalak. To Stalak! To Stalak! I love that stuff. Been drinking it for years. You know, I, I heard they recently decided to add more hops to it. You're all hopped out? is up everybody welcome back to another hoppy hour here as we review and taste another craft beer here on the show don't forget to like and subscribe if you like this series and guys i am so excited to try this one move Get out the way! As we have a hazy IPA to dive into that is right a double hazy IPA here today Let's get right into it. I'll quickly present the can. I'll have a taste. I'll present what's going on. This is the first time I've ever tried this. And then we will rate the beer and we'll take a look at what you, the people, have to say on the beer forums and on Untapped. Today, we are featuring the Just Gonna Scoot Right Past Ya. This is a hazy IPA, a double hopped hazy IPA 
from Wooden Ship Brewing Company here in Minneapolis. Coming in at 7.6% love the name just gonna scooch right past you very basic but memorable can art here with very cool logo the matte black can dark and celestial representation on the can here this is a hazy ipa with equinaut nelson and vic secret hops i'm not a beer expert i'm a beer lover and with that Let's get into it. Double hazy IPA this week. Cheers, everybody. Oh, wow. That's good. That's really good. Definitely bitter. It's a double hazy IPA. Not super sweet. Man, this is just... This is really good. I feel like for how this is advertised, for like the percentage, for it being a double IPA, people might want it to be a little bit more sweet as most ha hazy IPAs nowadays, in my opinion, are on the sweeter side. So the expectation is for them to be a little bit more sweet. Where this is a little bit more light, a little bit of citrus, not that sweet and it packs a decent punch as far as it being bitter, but it doesn't linger much at all This is excellent nothing in particular stands out about it, but it's a well-balanced double hazy IPA It's not super complex. There's not a lot going on. It's just honestly a pretty easy drinking double IPA like I could get in trouble taking down a four pack of this and it not being too sweet, not being too overly bitter or packing even too much of a punch. And I'm not talking that West Coast IPA bitterness. I'm talking rich in alcohol, double and triple IPAs as well. Those seven to 8% real hazy beers that literally punch you in the face and kick you in the gut. You can even see with this one, I said it was a little bit lighter, a little bit easier to drink. washing machine's about to explode. It's not as thick, not as juicy, again, as a lot of the hazy IPAs, especially the ones that come out around this time, spring and summer. I actually have not been to Wooden Ship yet, but I took a look at their website at their tap list for doing this review and man they have some really good options and i'm very excited down the road to do a second part to this hoppy hour beer review on site there at wooden ship mm, mm, that's good all right let's rate this puppy on untapped i just snapped a picture of it I'm writing in the description of untapped, well-balanced, nothing special, but nothing bad about it. Now it got a pretty high rating overall. And again, on untapped, it's out of five. Nobody rates anything even like above four commonly. Like if you rate something a four, a 4.1, a 4.2, like it better be one of the best beers you've ever had right or the community will roast you i don't know if i can give it like a 3.8 because there's nothing special though there's nothing other than its drinkability being up here something i know i can crush and enjoy which, which is good which is great to be perfectly honest but i feel like to be knocking on the door or even hitting that four there has to be something extra to it I'm gonna give this a, a solid 3.5. Can art as well too, if we're gonna rate out of five, I'm gonna do a 2.5. I mean, it's cool, it's memorable, which from a marketing point of view, that's, I guess, what you want, but there's just not enough there. And I'm gonna say it's hoppy, bitter. I don't think it's dry, definitely citrus, and I don't even think it's that sweet. I'm gonna add another one here and say balanced. All right, there we go. I just posted it uh, on untapped. So let's take a look at what the community has to say about it. Oh, wow. Okay, three point, I thought it was 3.8. 3.78 is the average on this one. Only 30 people have reviewed it as well. The community has it as a double hopped, dry hopped, hazy IPA 
with the hops that I listed earlier and likely butchered. Everyone has it as sweet, and I really don't think it's that sweet, to be perfectly honest. Some people have rated it as high as four out of five recently as well. So there you go. Find me on Untapped at VI Sports Talk. I think this is really good. Would I go out and purchase another four pack? Absolutely, especially because it's reasonably priced as well. It's not going to break the bank like Drecker. And again, I love you, Drecker. Sorry for being so critical of you <laughs> last week, but my God, rancid, bro, rancid. This has been awesome. I really enjoy this one. I'm excited to go to the tap room and I'll let you guys know how that experience goes. Definitely the uniquely named just gonna scooch past you this one was awesome i ain't scooching past you i won't forget about this one despite it not having anything overly memorable the fact that this is crushable and still a style that i really enjoy still a style that a snob even though i'm far from a snob could enjoy 3.5 out of 5 and this has been a great change of pace from what we had last week Again, if you like these beer reviews, if you dig this series, like and subscribe, comment, and let me know what beers that are available to the Midwest region I should review and check out next. Appreciate every single one of you, and I will see you on the next one. Again, sorry about the washing machine in that last segment. That was wild. I was trying not to laugh. I actually deleted a lot of footage of me just giggling, being like, I need one of those clip on mics or just to like set up because I have a few other mics, like set up the mic in the in the my pod track, my input box, just literally just right over there, right over there from my office is where I film the hoppy hours. But anyways, go check out Wooden Ship, especially that beer. It was great. It was great. We'll get a vlog going soon when I go and visit the brewery as it's actually not too far from where I live. Um, anyways, we got some hockey talk to get into here. We'll bring on Seth Topol from Locked On Wild. If you haven't already, go check that out on any podcast app. Episodes every day. Go check out his live streams and video version of the podcast as well on his YouTube channel, Locked On Wild. The hockey segment of the Soda Pod is brought to you by our friends at 7th Avenue Pizza. 7th Avenue Pizza can be found pretty much everywhere, man. Like even at my Speedway gas station down the road for me. They had some 7th Avenue pizzas in their small little like bucket freezer you take to the cabin. It was amazing. It was amazing. They're also at Jerry Foods, Lunds and Byerly, hy and more. If they're not at your local grocery store, Ask your local grocery store why they don't have 7th Ave on the shelf, first of all. But second, you can interact. You can ask 7th Avenue Pizza Matt and the team on social media yourself where the closest location is where you can pick one up, why they're not at your local grocery store, or to get in on contests and giveaways. At 7th Ave Pizza on all social media. Great people there. We love Matt and the team. And the prospect's amazing. You will never eat another frozen pizza again. You will never order your run-of-the-mill shitty Domino's ass pizza ever again either because you don't need to. You have the best of the best local company, great people, 7th Avenue Pizza, a proud supporter of the Soda Pod. NHL talk, wild talk, hockey talk here on the Soda Pod with our friend from Lockdown Wild, Seth Topo here on the other side. Let's get into it. Back for another hockey segment, and we are here with yet again the host of Locked On Wild, Seth Topol. Uh, how's it going, buddy? Going good. I uh, had a chance to celebrate my grandma turning 100 Happy this weekend. Happy birthday. So that Big was milestone. a lot of fun. Um, she's still kicking, just like uh, every team in the Stanley Cup playoffs so far. No one has been officially eliminated as of yet. That's true. The Tampa Bay Lightning and the Islanders uh, survive being swept. No brooms to be seen here in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Do you think either of them have a chance for a comeback? I know out of the two, Tampa obviously would be the team that you would choose out of the two, but that but I'm asking like, do either of them do you think like each in their series have a chance? I don't think so. And it's nothing like on the Tampa Bay side, they have played pretty well and still have been on the wrong end of all of those games. 
which is a testament to just how good the Florida Panthers are. Um, it, short of Andre Vasilevsky pitching a shutout, I just I don't think there's anything that Tampa Bay can do to keep themselves in that series long enough to win it. Um, the Islanders, honestly, that has that series has been way more close than I thought it was going to be. But same story, like pesky Islanders. They yeah. they've been playing an, uh, a a pretty heavy game, a pretty sh- shut down for first style. But their offensive options have been buzzing as well. Speaking yeah. of offensive options, though, like just going back to the Florida and Tampa series, like obviously. Ev- a lot of the temp or sorry, a lot of Florida's top guys are buzzing right now. Like Sam Reinhardt has three goals, but dude, Matthew could chuck seven points, three goals for assists in the four games. Like that, that's those are insane numbers. Yeah, he's they're just they're so playing fun. so well. And again, I don't think Tampa Bay is playing particularly poorly in that series. It's just that Florida team like took everything that they did in the run to the, the final last year and just stretched it out over a full season. And they just have so much they can hit you with. They've got Reinhardt, they got Barkov, they've got Kachuk. Like, how how do you shut them down? No, I know. And and like Stamkos has five goals, Kucherov has six assists, like like you said, the Tampa Bay, like Braden Point's playing well too, Hedman's playing well. It's just that that is just it's such a good series. It's such fun hockey with some of the NHL's most elite and we're spoiled almost to a fault that it's in the first round, but at least we're seeing it where guys are at as healthy as they're going to be in the playoffs because you know, you're coming off a season. There's going to be guys who are bruised and battered, but there's also going to be guys coming off injured reserve. Yeah. And that's the healthiest point of this tournament of this point in the season because moving forward it's just like look at the vancouver canucks look at the winnipeg jets we had guys taking pucks to the face i mean it doesn't get any easier from here and speaking of the vancouver canucks i mean i'm just buzzing right now at the time of this recording vancouver just came back and won in nashville they came to tennessee they I was going to say conquered. They survived and managed to get two wins, but this comeback, I mean, that's what playoff hockey is all about. It's funny. My notes here, Seth, check it out. I had originally when I made my notes while the game was going on, I wrote Canucks up in the series. And then I crossed that off as the game was going on. And I was like, I shouldn't have wrote that. I jinx it tied <laughs> in the series. And then after I crossed out tied and wrote lead the series, I don't know if you can see that the bottom note there, but. You're like you're like Jesse Pierce writing a gamer and having to uh, having to to rip it up and throw it away because the Wild blew a lead in the third period. Wow. Well, with goals from Brock Besser in the final three minutes, upon the Vancouver Canucks pulling their goalie, and then with just three seconds left, J.T. Miller, who my God has turned into a superstar in the National Hockey League. Pretty much since joining the Vancouver Canucks, he had 103 points in the regular season. He's been absolutely buzzing here in the playoffs. First goal of the playoffs, too. That not game winner, but tying goal to force the game into overtime. And when you have that much momentum, it, like I, I just knew the Canucks w- would win. Now, was I a little bit scared? Sure, because like anything can happen in overtime. And I hated waiting so long. I was just like, come on, let's go, let's go. But like with that momentum, I knew they were going to get it done. And right away, beautiful pass by Connor Garland to Lindholm. Lindholm gets it done. Good night, Jim Kite. Back to Vancouver, up three to one in this series. Now, the Vancouver Canucks are goalie-less. They've lost their top two goalies. Thatcher Demko, who not only is done for the series, but he might be done for the entire season, the playoffs. He might be shut down for the year. Casey DeSmith, their backup, who has a little bit of playoff experience. He is an NHL-capable goalie. He was injured in the last Nashville game, in the first game for Nashville at home. So now the Vancouver Canucks have called up both goalies for their AHL team, the baby Canucks there in Abbotsford and poor baby Canucks, Seth, as they fought tooth and nail to get in the playoffs. And now they have two brand new ECHL goalies to who their starting goalie right now in Abbotsford only has seven uh, AHL games 
on his resume. And now, you know, I mean, that is what the farm team is for. But like, it's just, oh my goodness, up and down the rankings, it's just decimated right now. But a uh, big shout out to the young 23-year-old Arthur uh, Silvos. He didn't have a bad game by any means, and he gets a huge clutch win. It was really cool in overtime to see that like half the Canucks bench went to Lindholm, half the Canucks bench went went to him. And uh, wow. I mean, you watch that game. I was going through, uh, well, I was, I was quite frankly like having a heart attack throughout that game a couple times. What a roller coaster for me of emotions. I'm obviously a Canucks fan, guys. And uh, <laughs> Got Bertuzzi here on the desk. Didn't bring a Canucks jersey to Minnesota because why would I? I brought my Minnesota jersey. But this is the only green and blue thing that I'm repping here, and it's plaid. It's Canadian. But Seth, like, what what are your what were your thoughts on that game? Well, just frankly, like, full credit to Vancouver for making the comeback. Two and goals, the Minnesota boy Brock Besser too. Two goals in two minutes, like just under three actually. Now that I'm looking at the uh, the recap from ESPN. But just inexplicably bizarre how Nashville let that one slip away. And you look at that game tying goal, and UC Saros is like just he's he's not anywhere near the cre- like he is he's full, not been good. Let's let's let's, let's be honest. Eagle. He's not he's not been as good as he's as he was throughout the season. No, like it, it just and this has happened to Nashville. Um, at points throughout their winning streak, at points throughout um, the the late part of the season, is they just have found inexplicable ways to lose these games. And what a difference it makes going back on the road, tied, as opposed to potentially having your season end on the other team's ice. Like, that's massive. Well, and the Vancouver Barn is not easy to play in because they those fans have been fiended. For some playoff hockey because outside of the bubble this is the first time rogers arena vancouver has hosted a playoff game in eight or nine years that's a long time that's a long time right the bubble was their last playoff appearance in eight or nine years like that's i believe it's nine actually so like that rink is just so loud and even when the canucks lost um in game two it was still roaring for them they're waving their white towels a canucks playoff tradition and yeah, it's just it's going to be absolutely electric. Now I hope the young Arthur can handle that because it, it, it's going to be so fucking loud, dude. Like it's going to be absolutely insane. There's going to be people banging on the glass behind them everywhere in the rink. But like, yeah, momentum's a real thing in the playoffs, and the Canucks they got it back with that one. That was huge. Yeah, this is you see this in the postseason all the time. Is just how big of swings you have from game to game. And like we we saw this with the Wild over the last couple of seasons, they'd win game one. Everybody was feeling like, hey, this team might might go on a run. Then they lose game two, and it's like series is over. Fire everybody! Like it to be able to hold a lead is vital because now if you're if you're Nashville, every option is on the table right now and like you like you mentioned UC Saros has been very average in this series like that is a problem for uh for Nashville because you're going to lean on him a lot yeah they lean on him a lot you're going to need to try to hold that Vancouver offense down and is he going to be able to make a critical save for you when it counts or is is Vancouver going to be able to just continue to to peck away at him. Yeah, Pedersen still needs to wake up though because he's been god awful in this. Does series. he have any points in this series? And uh, he Looks might have like, like he has two assists, secondary assists. Yeah, that's that's so bad, dude. When he's one of your top players. That's so bad. Yikes. Quinn Hughes has been nothing short of incredible though. Four assists, but like he's just. Yeah, it's been the it's, it's been, been the been big awesome. guys. It's been the big guys for Vancouver. Besser with the four goals. JT Miller's got five assists. Um, you know, Quinn Hughes, as you mentioned, it's been the guys you would expect, with the exception of Elias Pettersson. But for Nashville, it feels like it's just been a like full spread of different players. Like Gustav Nyquist scored his first goal of the series. Mark Jankowski, both yep. first time goal scorers in this series. Uh, Philip Forsberg has two goals. Like it Forsberg feels like has been an absolute beast, though, for them. Like he's been yeah. their offensive threat. He's so good. 
he's, he's so been a dangerous. monster as you'd yeah. expect uh by the way you're a basketball guy you're a hoops guy did you see quentin grimes in the audience i did not so do you know the connection with Quint, Quint, uh, between Quentin Grimes and the Vancouver Canucks? He's Tyler Myers' little brother. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Nice. And, you know, Tyler Myers being one of the tallest players in the... <laughs> it's actually, they, they have the same mother, and she's tall as hell, too. So it's like, it's, it's actually, it's absolutely insane. That's where they those, get it from each. Those tall genes run in the family. Well, NHL and NBA, pretty crazy, man. Yeah, it's it's a to have people in the same family that are playing uh, different sports at a high level like that's that's impressive. Speaking of um, famous athletes in the audience for Nashville, which, by the way, like what what a tremendous atmosphere to go to an NHL playoff game. Like there's mm-hmm. some of like the original six markets like, yeah, I'm sure, especially because of their new re- rink, like Detroit would be amazing. I'm sure the garden in Boston would be awesome. But like Vegas, Vegas. But like for me, Nashville, I think is number one for for shit like this. And uh, yeah, former maybe still i don't know i'm not a big fo- i'm not a big uh, football guy but uh, nfl player titans player if i'm not mistaken uh having some fun here in the audience as well take a look this is the best though with his daughter Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Honestly, that that kind of like uh so who's that? Uh Taylor Lewan, the one Titans. Taylor Pro Lewan, Bowl. yeah. Okay, yeah. Pro Bowl in 2014, 2022. Anyways, uh yeah, so Titans player there in the NFL. He kind of looks like my friend Hunter, and no joke, that's exactly what he would do in this situation. He would down the beer. He'd pick up his kid and make her drink the water, or like soda or whatever. She was drinking as well. But uh, more crazy shit to go on at Nashville. They had to delay puck drop, Seth, because of someone throwing a catfish on the ice. Tradition, right? Tradition. So I had to clean up that area and level it out. And also we had <laughs> uh, actress Ali Walker chugging a beer and i have the shortened clip here but she took a tall boy like a huge one and dumped that shit down the gullet of this catfish and uh yeah check this shit up all right only in nashville ali walker oh, no. oh my oh, god, god. Oh, that's that's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> that jersey's ruined dude that jersey's ruined oh I do love it though. I do love it how like Nash going to a hockey game in Nashville, especially a playoff game in Nashville, it's an experience. It's a party. It's something that like not just hockey fans need to experience, but like sport hardcore sports fans, especially those who love going to live events, have to experience. So um I would be weary of chugging a beer out of a catfish because of what the beer will bring back with it. Unless it's like, unless, unless it's been cleaned out and. Uh, There's a UFC fighter who drinks a beer out of an audience member's shoe after every win. So I'm sure that's a little bit worse. They called the shoey. No, no, Shep no, no, to no, no, Yeah. He literally will jump on the cage. Someone in the audience will throw him a shoe, throw him a beer and he dumps it in there and just, and you know what? Um, he. I just prefer from the can. I I did a I did a I did a shoey from my hockey skate, um, on a stream. Yep, it was gross. I gotta find the clip someday for you. I forget. I forget what. Sh- oh, you know, I, it might have been on the last Ryzen stream. Now that I think about it, Ryzen. I... By the way, is I I I'll, I'm I'll be streaming tonight at starting at two a.m. Central time, guys. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. You, uh, But everyone listening to this right now, I have not slept yet. I'm still working Monday as you guys are listening to this, uh, being up streaming all night. But anyways, um, let's talk about quickly the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yes, I'm going to dance on their graves. I know they're not in the ground just yet, but uh, 
man, both the fans are suffering and the players. Now, Bertuzzi doesn't give a fuck, and I can't show this clip, but Seth, you know the clip I'm talking about. Uh, Bertuzzi doesn't give a fuck. He's sitting there on the bench just like kind of focused on the game or just, you know, probably just thinking about something else all together. But Matthews, Marner, Nylander, who's back, and we don't know what he was Stuff, what, what, what he was uh, dealing with prior in the early parts of the Stanley Cup playoffs, anyways. Um, concussion, it was billed as a concussion, right? Yeah, that's a bold face lie. We, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, maybe it could be concussion and something, but like, I, I don't know. That we, we'll all of our questions will be answered once they are eliminated. And ladies and gentlemen, they will be eliminated. Nylander yapping on the bench, Marner throwing his gloves around, having a little hissy fit. Um, and even Matthews chirping at them as well. I mean, it seems like they're angry at each other. They're frustrated with their own performance. They're frustrated with the team's performance. And Boston, credit to them, are looking incredible. They're both in the Leafs' heads, and they are just winning every little battle there on the ice. I am going to make a football analogy here before I then circle back to what I think is going to happen this off season with Toronto, the Toronto Maple Leafs are the Indianapolis Colts of the NHL, a very, very good regular season team. Um, a ton of the best players. They've got three guys that are in the probably top 30 or 40 players in the league. And you've, you've got Austin Matthews is one of the best, if not the best player in the NHL. But they can just never win. They have advanced out of round one one time in the last 10, 12 years. Yeah, it's pretty bad. But then I saw, I saw a tweet today that was interesting on the Toronto front. I forget the reporter. Uh, otherwise, I would give, full, I would give them full credit because it's, it's a great take. What if Toronto, what if getting to the playoffs, like we, we think about all of these postseason failures for Toronto as Toronto being like Toronto being bad, being too, too bad to advance, not good enough to advance. What if Toronto's ceiling is just a team that can get to the playoffs? Like they obviously have had incredibly good regular seasons, but what if that's what, like, what if that's it? What if this is just the ceiling for this group? And on well, that that's point, the key word, Seth, for this group, because on paper, I'm sorry, a team this good, you're too good to just be a, a regular season team. You're too yeah, good it, just to be a first round playoff. Team. You are like, I'm sorry, but you're right. This group, this group seemingly can't get it done when push comes to shove, when you need to be clutch. And it's funny because like there's been a cast, there's been multiple casting characters come through here. Now the, the this this particular core has been around for this era, this de this decade at least, at least the the last eight, you know, seven to eight years. But even before then, when they had like other cores that would would do well in the regular season, it's like there's just this weird thing about the Maple Leafs hockey in the last twenty to thirty years where they just collapse well, when yeah. under pressure. And it leads me to believe that one of the three will uh, Matthews, Nylander, and Marner. One of the three will not be on the team next year. Well, Ma Matthews, they, they, I think will be here. I think he's just, yeah, uh, you're not going to, you're not going to get rid of Matthews, but I think they will just to, we got to try to hit this from a different angle type thing. I think one of the other two will be traded in the off season. Marner, I mean, Marner maybe. I like know it's he's just, the Toronto kid, but it's like, okay, he played for the Maple Leafs. They haven't won shit. Like that doesn't matter the, at this point. It's just gotten to the point where it's like, can they really justify just continuing with the same to try thing. to do this? Yeah. Like they have one, and then what happened the one time that they got out of the first round? They got killed in the second round. Yeah. No, then they, in fairness, they made little changes here and there, right? They brought up Matthew Nyes. He's playing a full season. Uh, Timothy Liljegren is actually playing 
Um, he's 24 now, but he's been in their system for a while. Um, I mean, Bertuzzi was a good acquisition as well and brought a little edge to the team, right? So they, they, they've made little changes, but funny enough, it's like, it might be the big crew. It might be the Tavares. It might be the Mitch Marners just not being able to get into that gear that they're able to get in the regular season. Again, in the most important time of the year. Now there's definitely flashes like Marner. He was good in their last loss. He was fine. He scored. Yeah. He looked good. But then it's like, where are the other guys? But in their win, Matthews was an absolute beast. So like there's spurts of it. It's just not consistent. And put it this way, even with the Vancouver Canucks right now, even though JT Miller has a decent amount of points right now, he hasn't been scoring in every single game with the Nashville Predators, right? But he's been noticeable in every game. He's been in the rush. He hasn't been an anchor. He hasn't been invisible. Whereas Pedersen has been an anchor making bad turnovers and has been invisible and missing the net and things like that. Like That's kind of what it's like, what I'm saying with the Maple Leafs. They'll be on one night or invisible. Whereas like the JT Millers, even if they're not putting up points every night, they're not invisible. They're They're consistently playing good hockey out there. So yeah, it's I, I, I'm thrilled because I absolutely hate the Maple Leafs. I think this is amazing. I, it's weird. Cause I'm like, it's weird. Cause I'm like, I'm not cheering for Boston, but I'm cheering for the Maple Leafs to lose. You are very much lesser of two evils here. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. But if, if the opportunity existed, you would hope that both teams lost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Right now, at the time of this recording, uh, the Capitals are down to the Rangers. Surprise, surprise. That's been the story of this series, as we predicted. But the games overall, Seth, have been close. And this one, too. The Rangers up by only one goal. Yeah, I, I will give full credit to Washington. These games have been way closer than I thought they would be. Um, and so you look at the end results, and it's been the Rangers winning all the games. But... I mean, just like, just look at the, look at the scores, like credit to Charlie Lindgren for uh, just doing as much as he can. I mean, four to three, three to one. And now today the, uh, the Rangers with, uh, with the early lead, but with the exception of game one, which was close for a while, like that was a close yeah, like game up until the, the halfway through the third period. Yeah, the four to one score that doesn't tell the story of the uh, the game. It was it was very close. It's just been it, it has just been about the only thing that you couldn't afford to have happen. If you're the Capitals, is Alex Ovechkin going cold? Like that was the that was really the only thing that you could not afford to have happen in this series. Yeah, well, and in fairness to the Rangers too, like they're shutting him down, and then there's like there's right. not really other options. Like Strom, he's I mean he's fine, but like it's weird because like there's not going to be another playoff hero to emerge from that team, right? Yeah. Um, I really like, hope they come like, back tonight. Again, we're recording late Sunday, guys. Um, but I, I, this might be the this might be the sweep. This might I be think sweep. this will probably be a sweep. Now, having said that, it will probably end up just to spite me that the Capitals come back and win this game. Hey, I would like that because my prediction was... Gentleman sweep, yeah. Um, One sec. What else do I have here? Yeah, okay, well, let's just get to my last thing when it comes to the NHL playoffs. Let's get into team slash series that I was wrong about um, going back to our initial first round uh, preview and predictions uh, just last week. So number one, Dallas versus Vegas. Now, Dallas does have a win in the series. It's two to one for Vegas. However, I did not think the Vegas would be out playing Dallas like this to this degree. Yeah, it's been honestly, it's been a little bit of a surprise that the top guns for the Dallas stars have just been as quiet as they have been. Like I know, I know in game two that Jason Robertson scored, but beyond that, he was invisible. Yep in that game and in that in in ot like down the stretch um just just got completely walked and you know wyatt johnston in game three he finally scored his first two goals of the series Miro heiskanen scored his first goal of the series but like 
you just you just need more. Like th that's the thing. That's the thing about having depth, like the Dallas Stars did. How often do we talk about the depth? They've got eight guys that scored twenty plus goals. You have to have somebody that steps up to take the lead, and is like, "All right, everybody, get on my back." I'm, I'm going to take you the rest of the way. And like you, you flip it over to the Vegas side, Mark stone just stepped right back into the spotlight and scored in his first game back. Did not expect him to look that good in, in one game. And to be fair too, like you look at the numbers, Robertson does have, uh, he's got four points in the three games, but like we need a, we need a shot to go get a goal to win a game. Like he's yep. got to be that guy, yeah. For this no, team, totally and agree. Vegas just has Vegas just has done the things that you need to do. And also, I know plus minus isn't a huge indicator, but like Miro Heiskin is a minus four in three games. Yeah, that's not good. That's your top de your top defenseman. He's playing twenty eight minutes, thirty six seconds a night. Yeah. Well, that honestly, it, to just counter, that's probably one of one of the reasons why, just because he's oh, out 100%. there the, the whole time. But yeah, no, for sure, you, you want to see him getting involved in the offense and making the getting having plus points or at least hanging around that zero, you know, minus one, plus one, whatever. But here's like here's a killer too. Rupe Hints and Joe Pavelski have zero points. <sighs> yeah, you can't have that. Mason for a team that we said one, yeah, for a team that we said like the depth is gonna challenge Vegas and beat them, and the depth's not showing up right now, and that's depth has got to show up. That's gonna Absolutely. sink you. Yeah. All right, number two, Winnipeg Jets. <laughs> I was wrong. Being outclassed offensively by the Avs, they're being outskated by the Avs. Hellebuck, though he's been fine. I mean, it's just it's just too much. It's too much. He's doing everything he can, but he's not able to like go. You know, friggin' superstar mode. Um, yeah, and Winnipeg just overall is not able, hasn't been able, anyways, to implement their physical game enough. Yeah. And the Avs are weathering the quick little storm that's thrown on them and then are just outscoring the Winnipeg Jets. So, yeah, I was wrong. The Avs are better than I thought, and the Jets, it's just not working. It's just not big, working. Big shout out to Alexander Gorgiev for bouncing back. Like after all the yeah, chatter of like, we gotta we gotta bench him. Like you gotta bring, you gotta bring the uh, I forget the name of their backup. Um, he he's been great. He just allowed the one goal in uh, in game four, and the Avs are just they're just too fast. Like they're just they, too are, fast. they are just they're skating circles around Winnipeg, and it, it honestly like this was the series I think I was most confident about in picking. Because the the vibes were just the too vibes good. were just so dead for Colorado going into the postseason, and, and they were they too good looked, for Winnipeg. They just looked like the, a completely listen, yeah. different team. No, yeah. no, for sure. Okay, before we move on to just uh, a few other topics, a few other stories, a few other hits here in the world of hockey, let's just do a quick little preview for the second round based on how things are right now. Now, if there, one of these teams has a comeback or makes things interesting, um, then, you know, whatever, this doesn't matter, but we'll get, that's why we'll just uh, fire through it quickly. Uh, let's just, let's just say, and this is the one that's probably going to be the longest of the series, but let's just say Vegas comes out of Dallas. Let's just say Vegas is the winner. Um, and Colorado beats Winnipeg because that's kind of where it's trending right now. Now, Dallas still could come out of this one, I think. They're they're mm -hmm. one of like the few as we go through this exercise for the second round that I think you know could just throw this all uh <laughs> all awry. But let's just say for prediction purposes, Vegas makes it Vegas, Colorado. Who wins in the second round? Well, considering what we've seen, I uh I gotta go with Colorado. I, I think they I think they got a w enough of a wake up call at the beginning of the series that they needed to kind of refocus. And it just has been just night and day different. And with Nathan McKinnon doing his thing, Kale McCarr looks absurdly good so far in this series. Like, yeah, it's it's the same story. Like, I think it's just too much for Vegas unless they can perfect their uh, defensive scheme, if they can run it to perfection, then they probably have a, a chance. I think it'll be a long series for sure, probably six or seven, but 
I I just I I cannot I'm not going to make the same mistake again going against the uh, the Colorado Avalanche in round two. Yeah, from what I've seen of the Avs against Winnipeg, whether Dallas or Vegas comes out of that one, the Avs are my pick for that one. Um, Vancouver up three one against Nashville, still crazy based on how they played against them, but they're 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 going to come out of that series. It looks like down their NHL goalies. Um, this is the other one, and it's funny how they're both coming out of the West, kind of like Dallas, Vegas. Let's assume it's going to be Edmonton, but LA surely could come back. They haven't even played yet at the time of this recording, Seth, which is absolutely insane, but playoff hockey central time, baby. Um, all right, Edmonton Canucks. I know the Canucks beat them all four times this year in the regular season, but the Canucks had their goalies, either DeSmith or Demko, for those games. So there's the caveat, but the Canucks did score a lot of goals in those games as well. Uh, six goals in one of their victories too, but Canucks Edmonton, who takes it? I have to go Edmonton here because goalie, goalie play. Like you are taking a huge leap of faith with a young goalie in a second round playoff series. And look, not to say that he is not going to be able to like stand on his head and win them a series because We've seen it happen before. It, it could certainly happen again. But the math just is not on Vancouver's side here. I think these will be high-scoring games because these offenses are outrageous. 100%. But I, like, even in a 7-6 to six game, you need your goalie to make saves yep. every now and again. And I just, if I had to get, if I needed to pick of Edmonton, and Vancouver, what they have available right now, if I needed a goalie to make a save, I probably would pick Stuart Skinner first. Yeah. Uh, for me, if LA comes out of that series, I think LA beats Vancouver. If it's Edmonton, I think Vancouver beats Edmonton. Ooh. Full, like, it's funny because I'm going to probably go the exact opposite. Because I would have more faith in what Vancouver is is throwing out there between the pipes than I do in Cam Talbot. Yeah, tough. Honestly, I, I don't think Talbot has been that bad. I just think that the Kings, if their goaltending shows up against the Canucks, they're going to make it harder for the Canucks to score. And mm. the Kings have offense; they do. So, like they'll yeah. they'll be able. It'll be harder for the Canucks to trade high offensive chances back and forth and goals with the, with the Kings. And I think it will be successfully with the Edmonton Oilers. So the high scoring games, I'm not, I'm not saying it's like, it's going to favor the Canucks overall. Cause like they, the high scoring games just don't favor either team. Cause it's just crazy. Um, but I think it, it's not the worst for them if they do have to play the Edmonton Oilers because they do have the personnel to match it. And it's not like the Edmonton Oilers defense and or goalies are super threatening. Whereas the Kings, it's, it's a little bit more um, overall, but yeah, I could be out to lunch there. I could be just drinking the Kool-Aid because the Canucks again, against a more defensive team like Nashville haven't looked the greatest, but when they go up against high flying offenses, they can come out not unscathed, but they, they can come out at, at least still limping. But anyways, yeah, less uh, as we, yeah, as we move over to the east, Florida, I think, is going to beat Tampa. And Boston, I know, is going to beat the frauds in Toronto. Florida, Boston. Wow. It Boy. is the rematch from last year, but in the second round. Wow. Um, I'll go Boston. I, I, I like got, I got Florida. I like Florida, what they've done, but I think we saw this Boston team learn from what happened to them last year, and they just have not looked unprepared for uh, what has gone on in round one. And I I think they've got some nice momentum rolling here. They play incredibly physical, so they're going to be able to match that with Florida, and um, I. I don't know. I, I think they just I think they come out on top in a couple of overtime games and I think they win in seven. I think Florida wins. I think it's gonna be a bloodbath of a series, but I think now that I think they're better than they were last year in the sense that like they have the experience now and that's huge. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're not just the underdogs in every game now. Like 
we're we're here. We're one of the big dogs, and we just took out Tampa, not with relative ease, but like you know. And that's assuming that Tampa doesn't come back, because I'll be absolutely crazy if Tampa came back in this series. And again, then this segment is completely moot. But uh, anyways, all right, you got uh, Boston. I got Tampa. Uh, New York. They're going to be Washington. They may even sweep them again at the time of this recording. But uh, New York against Carolina, which I imagine uh, is going to beat the Islanders. Who do you see winning? That's an interesting one because the Islanders have been playing good playoff hockey, right? They've been doing enough to stay in games, kind of like the Washington Capitals, except just with some better firepower, keeping it very close to the end in some games. Um but having said that, like Carolina's, they're still good. They're still good. They still have good offense. And the Rangers, it's like the fucking Capitals is keeping it close with you right now. So, yeah. are is that you know? I know you're winning, but even if you get a sweep, are, are are you the team that we're most critical of because you didn't make it? You know, hit it out of the park each each time. Didn't make it look easy. Yeah, I, I think, I think I'm gonna go Rangers in seven here. And yeah. I think that is with the caveat that it'll be the big dogs for the Rangers that lead them in this series against Washington. It's been pretty spread. Like they have had a bunch of different guys score goals in this opening round series, which I think will kind of help refocus in some of those, those top dogs, the, uh, the Criders, the Zabinajads, Breadman. Like they'll, those guys, I think, will be the ones that lead them into a second round series win. Carolina is incredibly deep. This is going to be a bloodbath, too. I think this series goes seven, but I'm going to go with the Rangers. Yeah, the Rangers should win. However, I will probably drop a bet on Carolina winning the series because they're probably going to be the underdogs. But uh, yeah, I think the Rangers are going to win this one, too. They should win this one. They should win this one. So there you have it. There you have it. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, some other news. And it's getting thin as we get into the summer here. But, uh, it, I mean, it'll heat up a little bit around draft. Mm -hmm. It always does. But after that, it's going to dry up a bit. And Seth and I are going to get creative with some of these segments. And uh, both on this show and Locked On when I appear there uh, every Friday. Um, but, yeah, let, let's just talk a little bit about some news in the world of hockey. Just want to pay our respects here on the Soda Pod to Al Shaver, uh, beloved and legendary voice of the Minnesota North Stars. He passed away uh, this last week at the age of 96 years of age. Uh, big shout out to him. All the love to his family, his friends, and rest in peace to that legend the thing that i like in these situations isha is the amount of stories that people share the amount of like kevin Falness was was going through and sharing old interviews on uh, on twitter which was for for people like me who are broadcasters by trade and did not have an opportunity to listen to al shaver as much as i would have liked um i i enjoy I enjoy getting a chance to see people remember those that they, that they appreciate. And, you know, it's guys, he, the press box at XL energy center is named after Al Shaver. Like he obviously is synonymous with hockey here in Minnesota. And so uh, it's, it's unfortunate that he is gone, but his memory is going to live on for a long, long time. Yeah, and up in Canada, we lost uh, a longtime broadcaster as well, Bob Cole, who is literally the second Foster Hewitt. Like he is a legend of CBC's, a legend of Hockey Night in Canada. Um, he passed away a couple of days ago as well at the age of ninety. Long time play by play, like I said, for Hockey Night in Canada and the CBC, five decades. He did play-by-play -play for the CBC and for Hockey Night Canada and for National Hockey League games north of the border. He was inspired by Foster Hewitt, who was like the first great play-by-play -play broadcaster in hockey. Bob Cole, I was lucky enough to grow up listening to Bob Cole. He was my era, my generation's Foster Hewitt, and it was it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. He retired in 2019, where that last year he he still had it, man. He still had it, but knew that like 
it's time for me. You know, 50 years doing play by play is enough. Um, and yeah, he passed away peacefully and just wanted to uh, you know, pay our respects to him as well. And again, the same thing, like every article I'm reading now from CBC, from TSN, Sportsnet, there's just so many great stories about him. And it's it's just it's just truly incredible here. Ron McLean of Hockey Night in Canada said his legacy will be that the players adored him. That's not easy. He has always said the game's the thing, not the show. The players so respected him. He was comfortable. He was professional. He was talented. He had various catchphrases as well. And uh, yeah, so two legends passed, but uh, some awesome memories of them. Some amazing, some amazing moments in hockey history from both Al and Bob. So rest in peace to the great broadcasters in hockey. Turning the page here, Seth, former Minnesota Wild coach, head coach, Dean Evison, looks like he's in the final running, perhaps even the first in the running for the new job as head coach of the Ottawa Senators in the National Hockey League. Do you think, A, that he's a good fit, and B, what are your, what are your friends at Locked On Senators thinking about this? You know, it's interesting because I I think for all of the things that we kind of rolled our eyes at when Dean was here, you look at that Senators team and it's a it's a team that just kind of lacks direction. Like they just they got a bunch of good players, they're pretty young and how many years in a row have we been talking about like they have playoff expectations, this is going to be the year that they get back there. And they just have never been able to kind of get over that hump. They need some order. And Dean is is very much a player's coach. But I think he can guide them in the right direction. Is he the coach that's going to get them to a Stanley Cup? Probably not. But I think he can get them to where they're going. Because Dean Evison won. like he had back to back a hundred point seasons playing with $14 million less in salary cap space than every other team in the NHL had. He, he got as much as he could out of that roster uh, over those, uh, those two seasons. And then obviously things went off the rails this year. Seemed like every button that the team pushed just did not work. I think he could be a good fit for the uh, the Ottawa Senators, who I think need some some guidance, especially defensively. It just it's it's a Senators team that I think just needs somebody that can kind of put belief in the guys and can help get some more out of them um, as they try to take that next step uh, in their progression. No. I love everything you said there about it. I love everything you said there about Dean, um, whoever is, a, is his assistant coach. Get a bunch of clip clipboards, baby, because you're going to have a bunch of broken ones. <laughs> and I know they're a little more expensive in Canada, so maybe order them off Amazon or something like that. Get, get them in bulk. Get them in bulk. Um, more coaching news. The Buffalo Sabres have hired Lindy Ruff again, Seth. That is right. They have hired Lindy Ruff, who is a longtime Buffalo Sabres player between 1979 and 1988. He also coached for the Buffalo Sabres as head coach between 1997 and 2013. Then he moved on to the Dallas Stars, New York Rangers, New Jersey Devils, and now he is back in Buffalo it's crazy because Lindy Ruff is one of these older, old school coaches, I guess, but he's still relevant and has been for a while. Now, when he was with the New York Rangers, he was an assistant coach. But other than that, he's been a head coach way more than he's been an assistant coach in the NHL. Yeah, it's it's similar thing that I was talking about with Dean Evison potentially going to Ottawa is it's a Buffalo team that kind of lost their way. And I actually had a chance to talk to the uh, host of Locked on Sabres about this. We did kind of an, uh, 
finally found an opportunity to do a crossover because with it being an Eastern conference team, you don't get a chance to talk to those guys a bunch. Right. Um, but he was saying like, it's, it's a Sabres team that just didn't really have an identity this past season. Like they, they tried to be a couple of different things and they were not good at any of them. So Lindy Ruff is going to come in and he's going to very quickly establish, like, we're going to do this. This is what we're going to be. And so again, it's a similar thing as it's just a, a team that just needs a little order. Like they need a direction to go in. And it's, it's funny too. Like it's not, it's not like he's coming in cold like Mike Babcock did where he hasn't been coaching for like five years. No, he he's... led the devils. He led the devils to a 50 win season last year. And he's Things been just... dealing with young players still, right? Yeah. Still. So that that's good. And Hey, with his time in uh, Buffalo as well, he dealt with some young superstars coached a uh, Buffalo Sabres team all the way to the Stanley cup finals, brought them to the finals t- or brought them to the playoffs 10 times in what is 14 year run. Like it's a, di- it's, it's a different time. I get it, but he still found some success recently with the Dallas stars as an assistant in New York. And like you said, with the New Jersey devils. Now this last year was not what the New Jersey devils, nor their fans, nor anybody in that organization had planned, which is why he was let go. But uh, yeah, this will be interesting. I, 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 I don't love it, but I don't hate it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to see how it pans out next year. And he's like, he's revered in Buffalo. Like, oh, he's a that, legend. He's a legend. That town loves like said, because he, he played Rock. there and coached there, Seth, for for many, many years, for for more than twenty years combined, right? Yeah, he yeah. he left his mark there. He still lives there, so oh, it'll be a boy. What a beauty! It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But I. I was skeptical going in, and once I heard kind of the the overall pitch for it, I I'm in. Yeah, um, Seth, we are in NHL playoff time, and one thing sacred to the NHL playoff, and we haven't seen it yet, but we're gonna see it. We might see it tonight. We might see it tonight if the New York Rangers defeat the Washington Capitals, and that is the playoff handshake at the end of a series. It's sacred because no matter how heated the series is no matter how much of a rival you are there there's so much respect and there's there's just honor in going to war with the team on the ice and we see it in the handshake now every now and then you got a you know a piece of shit like milan lucic can you know mouthing off saying i'm gonna kill you next year but still you know shaking the hand for the most part if the teams still have that beef it's a quick just shake of the hand and move on but sometimes you'll see guys who are yapping at each other, going at it, hitting each other, spearing each other, uh, yapping on the ice, you know, give each other like a good hug there and say, you know, it was a great series. And, and one, one, a special, one special moment especially is between the goaltenders who have usually like a little chat there after especially a long series that goes like seven. But every now and then, like I said, like with the Lucic incident, and I believe that was like back in like 2012, there's always one piece of shit. Every now and then. And that literally occurred 40 minutes ago, Seth, in an AHL playoff game between Toronto and Ottawa, where former National Hockey Leaguer, former Stanley Cup champion Kyle Clifford um, was yapping with a player that uh, apparently they were going at it all game. That is right. Kyle Clifford and Boko Imama get into it during the sacred handshake Line between the Toronto Marlies and the Belleville Senators. Check out this clip here. Winner in overtime, just 237. And now Imama and Kyle Clifford get into it. And Clifford's still heated. And first of all, I will tell you that Volko Imama said some horrible things the other night on the bench to Kyle Clifford. And kind of awkward. Kip Clifford comes over, shakes hands with David Bell. Things that, quite honestly, I don't know if the Mile, the Marlies would ever do this, file some sort of protest, but... Can you get, guess which broadcast that was, by the way? <laughs> A little biased to Toronto. But yeah, they've been yapping uh, throughout the series, going back and forth, and I'm sure he said something, you know, some smart-ass comment to him there at the end. But look... You be the better man. 
You don't say anything. You do. Maybe you don't even do a shake. Maybe you do one of these and you just skate on. And it's like, what, what is, what is saying something in the handshake line going to accomplish? Like you've already lost. And if you're the, if you're the team that won the series and advanced, the other team's going to just remember that and they are going to beat the brakes off of you the next time they play in the regular season. Yeah. Like it's just, it just goes to show you too, that those guys get so competitive during series that those guys whose job it is to kind of feed off of that. Sometimes they can't turn that switch off right away. Like sometimes it takes them, you know, takes a cool down to, uh, to be able to switch from like, on ice agitator to just regular dude. Yeah. No, for sure. Um <laughs> congratulations to the senators or not the senators to the Belleville Senators. And uh yeah, I mean, we'll see we'll see game 1 next year in this you know, give assuming both these guys are still with their respective teams, Clifford with the Marlies and uh Imam with the with the Belleville Senators and we'll see how it plays out next year but again this is just like I saw this on Twitter right before right after the Canucks game right before we started recording here and I was like okay we gotta talk about this we gotta talk about the handshake line because we're in playoff time in every single league by the way juniors NHL AHLs we saw there and about to begin here Seth as we wrap up the show with this final segment the PWHL playoffs are about to begin May 6th is the start of the PWHL playoff. How it works is the four top teams in the six-team league are going to compete, and the top team, which in this case is the Montreal PWHL team, they get to pick who their semifinal opponent is between the third and fourth seed. So the Minnesota team finished third, Boston finished fourth. So Montreal has 24 hours before the deadline to choose either Minnesota or Boston to face in the semifinals, but their first round of the playoffs. And then Toronto would play the other team. I actually like this aspect. And as more teams are entered into the league, knock on wood, it it continues to expand. I love how like that is a perk and something that you want to keep in the back of your head all year is like, we have to finish first. Like if, if we're a good team and there's like a a few other good teams here, like we're not going to settle for second place. We're going to settle for first place in the league because we have that power. We have that edge. Yeah. It's, this would be so interesting if they did this in the NHL because it like, there just are so many ripples because yeah. let's say, let's say you're the number one. Let's say you don't pick the four. Then the four thinks, okay, they're scared of us. And it's like, it's interesting too, because let's say, you know, if, let's say the NHL did this and the Dallas stars got the opportunity to pick the team that they played, but the eight seed has beaten them three times in the regular season. Like, normal math suggests that you just pick the eight seed. Yeah. But maybe that seed is just a really bad matchup for you this year. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of mind games that go into this. And then if you're a coach, how much do you, how much do you think about it? Like, do you just make the pick or do you like, do you think about it a little bit? Do you allow yourself to kind of get in that mindset of like, am I going to overthink this? Yeah, no, I, I I love it. I don't think we're going to see it any time soon or at all because the NHL no. doesn't like anything that resembles even a gimmick, but this is just... I think this is more incentive than a gimmick. Oh, yeah. This is like this is something that the PWHL will... Um, they'll keep. And it's... I don't know. It's fun. It's a fun... It's just a fun spin on... Um, it's just a fun spin for the number one team. Like not something we've ever seen where it's like, Oh, congrats. You get to pick who you play. Oh yeah. Okay. No, for sure. And if Montreal picks Minnesota, those will be the two teams with the, who, uh, who each 
had the highest attendance for respected games, whereas Montreal had uh, a highest attendance record of 7,045 people, whereas your Minnesota PWHL team, 7,138. And Montreal, for their last game of the season, which I believe was against Toronto, or one of their last games, they had like a, a huge, huge crowd show up. I believe it might even have been around that 7,000 mark and it was televised and I, it was just really cool to see the like, TSN up in Canada covering anyways, just showing a lot of pride for it and being like, look, we, we don't even have names of franchise yet. And people are coming to, to support the women here. So I, I, I've said it once. I've said it twice. I've said it three times. I'll say it again, Seth. Wow. You put hitting in women's hockey and look what happens. Look really yeah. interesting. It's, it ain't, this ain't fucking ringette, bro. This is hockey. No, it's it's been a lot of fun to watch. Um, I, I've had it's a been chance, awesome. I've had a chance to tune into a few games, and it's it is incredibly physical. I want to go to a few games next year. I didn't have a chance to go this year, but I want to go to a few games next year because that it, that would be electric. That would be electric. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hell yeah. Well, that does it for this segment of the show, Seth. Again, every feels like every day, still every day, dropping content on Locked on Wild. What do you got coming up this week on both your YouTube channel and on the podcast side? Uh, we have started a new bit that will be running every day of the offseason, uh, random wild game of the day. And basically, I'm just simming through games from previous seasons and just seeing what the win-loss record ends up being. Uh, so far, four and three uh before recording mondays um and you can find those you can find those on all of our social media platforms they're about 60 seconds so we're keeping them short but not only that and we'll just continue to uh continue to sift through the wild season we're going to start getting into player evals um probably this week or next just just continuing to kind of navigate through the postseason and uh keep some cards in the deck for the off season too I have an idea that just came to me for like a summer segment that, that you could do as well. Um, assuming you have the NHL game, but you could sim a be a GM mode, starting with the roster we have right now. And like every episode, um, I don't know, like a lot, maybe like 20 games that you sim through and you make some, you make some changes for the season coming up. Right. And you act as Billy Garen, but like every episode of the series, you sim, a handful of games so like the series doesn't go on forever like but you can get a good chunk of the summer and then hopefully knock on wood the last couple episodes you're in the playoffs right yeah that would be a great idea in fact because i do have nhl 24 there you go i think uh i think we'll get that rolling there you go there you go look at that also uh also think tank session here on the soda pod seth have a great week. I will see you back here next Monday. And for everybody who tunes into Seth's show, I will be on his show this Friday on Locked on Wild. Thank you as always, sir. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks to Seth as always, ladies and gentlemen. A lot to cover there. And a lot will be fast paced. A lot of info we talk about will be moving real quickly, which is why I kind of already did our second round preview and prediction now there might be an upset or two i really think maybe only one as we looked into the future there but things will slow down as the as the second and third round are upon us might do some bonus episodes too throughout the week if like some big upsets do happen or some crazy news drops in the world of this throughout this nhl stanley cup championship run before we let you guys go here just want to give a big shout out to our friends at better edge i mean look every now and then i bet on hockey i mostly just like to watch hockey but i've been i've been going ham on the ufc now that the ufc has been added to better edge hope they add some more mma leagues i'll have to talk about them there i'll be their best customer they are already like five or six cards ahead that you can bet on, that you can get your picks in, that you can join pick'em contests on in regards to mixed mar the highest mixed martial the highest mixed martial arts promotion, the ultimate fighting championship. I've been cleaning up 
Even last UFC card where I was so close to going 10 and 3 on predictions, one big on some underdogs there. And as always, every week, Hoppy and I are playing National Hockey League games and making picks there. And as the NFL season starts in a few months, Hoppy will be playing that too. Again, another local brand here, and we have something for you guys. That's right. We have a $20 sign-up bonus for our SodaPod listeners and subscribers here on YouTube. That is right. Go to betteredge.com slash SodaPod to claim your $20 sign-up bonus and go head-to-head with Haw- with Hoppy or myself on the platform in regards to NHL picks or UFC picks. Every week, I'm going to be making UFC picks on better edge again that's betteredge.com slash soda pod it's a free platform with legal betting in the great state of minnesota as well as 44 other states and if you like the platform if you want to get more out of it you can check out better edge premium premium players have access to free entry to premium pick them contests order grades advanced order filterings api access and more more details at betteredge.com slash premium but if you're just starting out today take our gift it's free money betteredge.com slash soda pod challenge my ufc picks or check out the hockey picks that hoppy and i are both playing throughout the rest of the playoffs better edge a proud supporter a proud partner of the soda pod. All right, guys, that is it. That is the show. I want to give a big shout out to everyone who has subscribed to our YouTube channel. If you want the best experience of not only the hoppy hour, but the podcast itself, go check it out on YouTube. We post it weekly on YouTube as well, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody who continues to support us on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate you. Don't forget to follow. Don't forget to rate and review on your podcast app if you can, as it just really helps us. If you listen every week, you might as well take that like five extra seconds. Give us five stars. Give us a review of any kind, of any of the segments, of any hockey talk. We are totally responsive. And then we can respond now on Spotify, for example. And if you want to be interactive with us, you can find us on social media at SotaPod on Twitter and at the SotaPod everywhere else. We're going to be a little bit more active on Facebook, but we are very active on YouTube. We reply to all your guys' comments, so check us out on YouTube at the Soda Pod. Subscribe. We do weekly streams and post daily clips of our podcast on the channel every single day, like I said. And we have every week Judd's Buds live Wednesday night, 6.30 p.m. Central on that channel as well. And next season, we're going to be doing a lot more live streams, a lot more interactive content on the YouTube channel. So get ahead, subscribe, like this video if you haven't already. Really appreciate you guys. That's it. Signing off. I'm Isha alongside my friend Seth Topol. This has been the Soda Pod presented by our friends at Better Edge, 7th Avenue Pizza, Northland Vodka, and Waggle Golf. Don't fear, just drink some beer and stay wild.